Welcome to Riverdale. I'm your host, Bob Barth, and on tonight's final episode of the podcast, at least for a while, um, we have director Lee Tolan Krieger on. Uh, but before we get to that interview, I really need to thank some really important people with whom this podcast would not exist. And first and foremost is our showrunner, with whom the show Riverdale would not exist, Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. I um, around I want to say November of this past year, had suggested that, that this was something that uh, might be enjoyed by the, by the fans, by you guys. And he wholeheartedly embraced the concept and helped out when we hit some adversity. So um, he, of course, has been instrumental. And two other people that were just... I couldn't have done this without. One is our associate producer, Amy Myrold, who bent over backwards... For me, to make sure that this was something that uh, I could get done in a timely manner and um, and helped arrange some of our great interviews. Um, thank you, Amy. I've been very blessed to work with some amazing people, and Amy is at the top of that list. Um, and the other being our uh, post coordinator, Michelle Jensen. Michelle was absolutely instrumental in helping to book um, many of our guests, specifically our actors. Uh, I have to say that that is the most challenging part of doing this podcast is getting people to agree to a place and a time <laughs> to sit down and do it. Everyone wants to do it, which is nice, um, but it's uh, it can be a challenging thing and there's no way I could have done it without Michelle's help. Um, I'm good behind the mic and I'm a good chatterer and I mix it okay. <laughs> I'm not the best at that either. But uh, as far as coordination is concerned, I, uh, I'm, I'm really just a bull in a china shop. Um, so thank you very much. The next thing I have to say to you guys is your participation in the show has really been fun. Being able to read the tweets on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of the ways that, that we contact and just you saying how much you have enjoyed the show and the interviews has really meant the world to me. Um, and it, they, those comments do not fall on deaf ears. And I want to reiterate this. And you should know this. The power of the audience um, is great. Meaning that if this is something that you enjoy, if you have really enjoyed the Welcome to Riverdale podcast... I implore you to tweet uh, Warner Brothers Television, tweet The CW, um, tweet everywhere how much you've enjoyed it, and um, that's the way we can keep this thing going. If people know that it's something that is wanted um, and desired and really kind of um, broadens your, your enjoyment of the, of the TV show Riverdale, then you let those people know and they will do their darndest to make sure that that we can do this again for season two which is already being worked on folks so this was a very exciting thing so again yes if you love this podcast let people know there is no greater influence than the influence of the audience um now on to our interview today so we have on director lee tolan krieger lee directed the first, the pilot of Riverdale, then back to back episodes two and three. And then he came back for our star studded uh, finale that you just saw. Um, Lee is an incredibly busy director and going back and forth to Atlanta, working on a new pilot, among other things. And I was not able, as I've been able to, for most people, get him in person so we had to do this over the phone so i'm going to say i'm the reason i'm saying that is to say this there are parts of this interview where the quality is not uh what i would love uh but hopefully it is not so distracting that you can't enjoy it lee has so many thoughts on um on, on the finale in particular, and there's so much to be learned and loved. 
So I hope you can bear with me and um, and our lovely cell phone that uh, that did this recording. So with that in mind, welcome to Riverdale. Archie. Betty. Veronica. Jughead. I'm Cheryl Blossom. For one shining moment, we were just kids. The bright neon lights of pops keeping the darkness at bay. Lee Tolan Krieger, thank you so much for sitting down with us this afternoon. Glad to be here, Bob. Thanks for having me. This is great. Now, uh, Lee, Lee's work you might know from Celeste and Jesse Forever, and, and actually a, a film that uh, I recently watched, I want to say within the last six months, and I am crazy about The Age of Adeline. Oh, thanks, man. That's a great, great film. Thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. That was, uh, it was also, also shot in Vancouver, like Riverdale, and, and was sort of my first project up there, but uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, we, should, we should say this. Uh, Lee, of course, directed our season finale, but he also directed the pilot, as well as back-to-back episodes two and three when the show was picked up, which is, you know, a monster weight of, of what this show is, tonally and story-wise and everything else. You established that, which is amazing. Well, yeah, well, this was, um, I, you know, a, a true collaboration, obviously, between a lot of different artists, um, starting with, with Roberto, our, our creator, as you know. I know he's been on the show. Um who really had such a clear vision of what the show should be, and and really from the very first meeting, Roberto and I were totally in sync on on the world and feel of the show. I mean, I think in my first meeting with him, I sort of described seeing it as you know American graffiti if told by David Lynch, you know, um, sort of through the, the Lynch prism, the Akana through the Lynch prism, as it were, and. Um, and so we were always in sync, and I think that comes through the pilot that, you know, everybody was sort of marching in the same direction, and that the target we had set for ourselves was was very very clear from from this, you know, from the very beginning. And that we, uh, we I think we were success, successful in hitting that target. Um, but yeah, the pilot in particular was a ton of fun because, as is the case with all pilots, you have a little bit more time and a little bit of money to polish and refine and uh, facet. Um, so yeah, we had a great time and it's, it's such a good time that I wanted to come back and, and try to, you know, continue the tone and look of the show that we'd set in the pilot in the first couple episodes and make sure that it get, you know, skewed right off the bat. Sure. No, and you do, you do such a great job and it, it, the show, and we've talked about this with Roberto as, as well as with others, the show has such a very specific, um, feel and tone and something that is yeah you can name references from other things that it sort of touches upon but it truly is its own and you know you as as the director as well as obviously your collaborators you know you really set the groundwork for what is to come because as people who may not understand the way a, a television series is made after you come in and do the pilots and then as you did two and three back to back the baton is then you know, handed or rather maintained by other directors who who come in, right? Yeah, it's it is. I mean, in the network world, if you're not doing, you know, uh, uh, True Detective, you're not doing what Carrie Fukunaga did with True Detective, where you're directing all the episodes, and obviously, or the Duffer Brothers directing most of season one of Stranger Things. Um, in the network world, that really doesn't exist, just because of the timeline, right? That the you don't have. 10 episodes worth of material to shoot. When you go to camera, you might only have the first three or four, um, and then scripts are constantly coming in, and, and that's, you know, just a, a product of, of the volume at the network level and also just um, timeline of when things need to be turned around. So, yeah, you have other directors coming in, episodic directors coming in, and, um, and, and taking the baton, as it were. And, you know, I think, you know, I've seen, I, I've seen now all of the episodes, uh, Except for 112, um, and I think I think the directors that came in did a fantastic job. And I know that you know having Roberto there as a as a guide would would have been very helpful. Um, but hopefully, hopefully the tone and look, uh, the feel of the show, 
uh, in theory, should be really, really clear so that, you know, the pilot becomes sort of a, a, a blueprint, a roadmap to, uh, to, the, to the series, as it were. So um, uh, that, that hopefully we were successful at least in creating that. And, and also you know, maybe pointing out where things could be improved. <laughs> there's, always, there's always that, too. Sure. You know, and, and this definitely has a very um, uh, filmmaker-like quality to eat just the style and that's not even um uh not even taking into account um you know uh costume or, or or set design things like that but just camera angle style um i'm thinking in particular you know you, you have some great jail cell sequences in 13 and i mean this incredible and we'll talk about it in, in depth as we get into it but this incredible uh river um frozen river sequence which looks like it's from a film it this doesn't look like typical uh you know cw television not not to say anything bad about the cw <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> look i mean somebody i did in in the conversation talking about the look of the show my long time collaborator david lanzaberg my, my dp for many years now two features which was celeste and jesse and, and the age of adeline which you mentioned and uh and and we just really yesterday i flew back to la we we just finished our fourth pilot together uh riverdale being one um and happy land being one and, and a pilot called beyond which is now in its second season over at uh, freeform yeah. um the reason david deserves so much credit I mean, he's an incredible artist in his own right um but he's a able to, you know, I can say, David, I want it to look like X, Y, and Z, and then he's got to really execute on that. And and not before I get too lost in the weeds there, um, some of the filmic qualities that you, you mentioned, if, if we were successful in that, um, you know, a lot of it had to do with, you know, David had, had brought up the notion of shooting the pilot, this is going back to the Riverdale pilot now, on the, the Leica lenses. Um, I know I'm getting a little nerdy on you, but um, these are... <laughs> really, really sort of beautiful set of lenses um, that are not common in TV. I think when we shot the pilot on, when we shot the Riverdale pilot on the Leica lenses, we were the first first TV show to use them. They're generally feature film lenses. They're really expensive. They're really beautiful. Um, the fall off on them is, is severe. They're very fast. They're a, they're a one four. And so, you know, from the get-go, I was able to shoot the whole show wide open, which which for the non photography fans out there means shooting at a one four. Um so that so that the depth of field is as shallow as it possibly can be. So if you're looking watching the pilot, um, you know, and you see you see Archie and Betty in the diner and those close ups where, you know, there are eye but by the time you get to their ears it's very, very soft and the rest of the diner all those beautiful sort of pinks and blues in the diner all sort of fall off into this kind of dreamy, um, you know, state, as it were. So we really wanted to put, which is much more of a sort of filmic or, or, or feature film aesthetic than it is television. I think you're seeing it a lot more on TV now, but 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 um, but it is certainly more to be something you see in features. But David was the kind of first to say you should look at these Leica lenses. I should, he shot a movie called Paper Towns on them and I loved them them and felt, I felt madly in love with them and um, and that was a big part of, of, of setting look and when Steve Jackson the series DP took over um, he had sort of wanted to shoot on other lenses and you know, that were less expensive uh, for, for good reason by the way um, and I pushed very hard to keep the Leica lenses on for the series which they they did and, and hopefully that was a you know, small little sort of piece of, of of hopefully why the show kept its its more sort of cinematic quality. So sorry for the earful there, but I just I wanted to mention David and sort of why you know the show hopefully keeps a, a more cinematic quality and something with with a bit more scope. Absolutely, no, it's uh, it's great. And for the uh, young filmmakers in the audience, you, you've given them uh, a lot to uh, learn learn from. Well, ho hopefully. We'll learn what not to do. We'll get into that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lee, let's take it back a little bit. Where are you from originally? I'm, I believe it or not, I'm from Los Angeles, California. Here, um, my parents are not in the business, but I am uh, born and raised here in LA, and uh, even went to uh, USC film school. So, even went to you know studied film here in town as well. 
Very good. And so how old were you? Obviously, by the time you're at USC, one of the biggest and well-known film schools in the world, um, long before then, how old were you when you first got the bug, when you knew that this was going to be with you for the rest of your life? Um, it's a good question. I, I don't know exactly. I, I, I know I was very, very young. Um, again, really getting into sort of some of my nerdy background. When I was really young, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I, I got into magic. And then magic sort of turned into an interest in special effects in movies. Um, I was really into uh, the Back to the Future movies, like a lot of people from my generation. Um, I got really into the Terminator, uh, Terminator 1 and 2, the Cameron's Terminators, of course. Um, Terminator 2 came out when I was like eight years old, and I was just you know, obsessed with the special effects in it. And so that started a kind of fascination with, you know, how do we how do we do like how do we create special effects and and, and using families enormous video camera to try and achieve that. Um, so pretty young, and then and then when I was 13, I was uh, invited to the set of a real movie a movie called executive decision with uh, kurt russell and holly berry i don't know if you sure know, absolutely in uh, 1996 and um and so i was on a real set and saw like you know a steady cam operator the rig on and this is in the days of film of course and seeing you know panavision lenses and a thousand foot mag and listening to the film and through the camera and I, you know that was for me kind of a i identify as sort of the moment i was like all right that's it. This is what I, want. I have to do. This. So that that's probably as as close as I can get to to a specific moment. But was into movies and movie making a, a bit before that. Amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's those uh, those those first days when you get the bug and you're like, oh no, I want to do this forever. Is uh, it, it's you know they're always unique stories. Yeah, for sure. I, people come to it different ways. Uh, that's that's for sure. How. Uh... How did Riverdale come about for you? Um, you know, I, I had um, I had gotten a call. I think first, I mean, my, my my reps had called me saying that they wanted to meet on the project. Um, I had I had met with some of the Warner Brothers executives, sort of maybe six months prior to kind of the, the real pilot season to talk about what they were they were doing and what they were cooking up, and they mentioned Riverdale and. You know, I certainly, like, I knew of Archie and, and the world, but I wasn't, I, I can't claim to have been, like, a diehard Archie person. Like, my wife, it turns out, was. I didn't even know that about her until <laughs> this, this Riverdale happened. But um, I wasn't a diehard Archie person, for, for better or worse. Um, uh, uh, but intrigued by that and, and had read some of his work before and, and knew he was a great writer. And... Um, but again, I didn't know what to expect because I think, as as described at the time, as sort of, oh, it's sort of you know you know teen drama, and I I wasn't I wasn't that keen on doing sort of a, a high school. Thing. I didn't want to do Dawson's Creek, you know what I mean? That I mean, sure. as, as much as I love that show, that just wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and then I read Roberto's script and was blown away how you know dark it was and and visual and um, kind of me there was something about it that that tapped into the you know what i love about american graffiti or the outsiders or you know some of those sort of you know coppola lucas movies about the 50s and 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 you know kind of a subversive look at uh, the the kind of you know uh, golden age of america and and i mean some would call it that others certainly would not but um and so for me, there was something really kind of cool and exciting about that, and that it's all still present day. Um, and then I met with Roberto and Sarah Schechter, who Sarah is um, Greg Berlanti's sort of you know right hand person and, and runs Berlanti Productions, and and we talked a lot about it, and we just got along right away. And then I sort of described the show that I saw when I read it. You know, for, luckily it was sort of the same show that they saw, and it was kind of from then on. It was like, all right, we're we're doing this together. It wasn't a long. Sometimes with these things, there's a long process of of how do we, you know, is, is this the guy? And then maybe we do another meeting, and um, it was it, it sort of felt undeniable for all of us from that first meeting that this was this was going to be a good collaboration. 
No, absolutely. And um, working with that bunch uh, for the entire season, um, yeah, when your name comes up, there's a certain amount of reverence that goes with it. So you <laughs> well, are you are well loved within the Riverdale they've very, crew. They've been very, very sweet to me, and I can tell you that um, I, I share the, the, the reverence goes both. I really bear on this for, for Sarah and Roberto, also Ryland and Virgil in there who, who's part of the Berlanti family um, they were all you know enormously helpful in the process and 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 wonderful to work with and, um, you know I just had a great time and I'm I've, I've haven't been doing this that long but I've done enough pilots and enough features that you know I know um, it's not always that way and this was just one where everybody everybody got along you know everybody saw the same show and that's yeah. that's um, that's that doesn't happen all the time yeah you're absolutely right so you get up to Vancouver and you're shooting the pilot and uh, we've, we've been through the pilot with, with Roberto a bit, but I, I, just from, from your point of view, like what was, what was kind of your biggest challenge on the pilot? Oh man. You know, the, the pilot's interesting because the, the pilot doesn't have any real major set pieces. I mean, I guess you could say the stuff we did on Sweetwater River was, you know, was as close to a set piece as one could have and just that you've got like every character in the show is going to be there and you've got this stuff on the water which is always really challenging um you know outside of that it's always the same with, with every project you know you want a little bit more time and a little bit more money um <laughs> but 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 specifically with kind of production related things i think it was you know it was it's a huge cast as you know and so cast this enormous ensemble not only a big ensemble but look, your your cast is iconic characters to people reveal such a relationship. The thing about Archie Comics is, you know, it's a sort of a 70 plus year uh, public people have you know, depending on your age and Archie, people have different connection to it. You know, my dad has a different connection than I do um, and somebody in between my age and my dad's age would have a different connection. Somebody to it now Riverdale with a completely different um, uh, connection to it. So, so it was it, it, the casting component of it was um, was was really challenging just to make sure that we were finding roles that were right for the script Roberto had written, but also upheld the sort of seventy five years of iconography that those those actors established. Um, and and David Rappaport and his partner Lindsay did did an, you know an incredible job. Uh, uh, casting the show, I should definitely give them a, a shout out here. Um, and then, and then the the aforementioned Sweetwater River sequence was really challenging. But you know, we were lucky that um, JB Mornville, our line producer, who very sadly passed away after we did episodes two and three, uh, he had he knew, you know, I explained to him the vision I had and wanting to, you know, really make it big and cinematic right off the top that you feel like you're you're in this this the canvas for this show is going to be really large which is why you know you see drone footage you see you know us doing big crane work on the water which means putting 30 techno cranes on a tourist then go on a barge which then are towed out to the water you know there's these things where it's like oh you know it's cheryl on the rocks and she's you know they're shivering easy right that you read on the page but then when you up your sleeves and get into the nitty gritty of, of what it takes to achieve that kind of shot. It's it it's you know it's um, it tends to be a little bit more complicated, and that's always the case. With with the Sweetwater River sequence, that was um, especially true. You know, just because again, anytime you want to put a camera on the water and have it be moving, is a ton of moving pieces that that you know have to kind of all line up. So JB. Um, bless him wherever he is. Uh, understood that and really was supportive and 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 made it happen. Um, which which I'm you know uh, eternally thankful for. Um, but th- those those are the two things that, that really come to mind in terms of the big challenges. Yeah, you know, and it, it uh, you finish a pilot and everyone sort of walks away, and unless it's a, a giant disaster, you feel confident about it. But regardless, and you know this, regardless of how 
good pilots come out, there's a set of variables that is completely out of your control as far as what's sure. going to get picked up and what's not. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, my imagine, I imagine that you walked away going, being very proud of, of the work you had done. Well, you know, look, I mean, you know, as, as you mentioned, it's, there is a whole bit of that kind of, it has to be shooting quickly and, and the hours are long. And, and generally speaking, you know, I felt really good about this cast. You know, so much of it, again, comes back to this cast being so great and, and so right for these parts. Um, and I felt like going through, I was like, you know, these guys really do fit these parts and 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 you you know you can all right and some of that is just you know the alchemy of, of those actors in those roles is you know you do your best to control it in the cast process but some of it is a little bit of luck quite honestly and we, i felt good about that and i also felt confident that um david landsberg my dp and i had 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 achieved what we set out to do just in terms of what how we wanted the show to visually feel you know and there's things like i mentioned about the like a glass or shooting wide open or using a lot of atmosphere to kind of make it feel somewhat ominous all the time even if we're in a high school hallway you know a kind of a, a more innocuous surrounding we give that sort of you know um, ominous edge and and so I felt good about those things but again you know until you get into the cutting room and really see how these pieces sort of come together it's very very hard to tell um, you know we, we were lucky in that you know Greg Berlanti being a uh, a TV, you know, um, uh, an icon and sort of a towering figure in the world of television. There's nobody more seasoned than, than he is. And, and um, you know, he really knows how to shape a pilot and was really helpful. That ultimately it was a, it was a, it was a piece that the, the studio network would see as kind of an undeniable uh, show for them. Um, and so that, you know, it was, it was, it was, we were lucky in that it seemed pretty clear from even the first cut going to the studio that they were they were very bullish about it. But 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 you know, but even so, like you said, there's a million factors after that 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 come into play. We we're not a high concept show. You know, we don't have a superhero in our show. You know right. what I mean? We yeah. there's not this big hook. It's ultimately a high school um, drama. You know, right. so so um, yeah, there there was all factors that. Um, that we never were, we, we were never counting our chickens uh, early. It was, it was, we'll wait to pop the champagne until we get official word, if that makes sense. Exactly. And then you do get the word, you do pop the yeah. champagne, and sure enough, you're back in Vancouver shooting two and three simultaneously, basically. Yeah, no, well, yeah, very much so. We, we cross-boarded those episodes. Um, yeah, I mean, and initially I, I, I wasn't able to come back due to, I was going to be doing the movie, and the movie went away, and, and Sarah called and said, hey, we'd love for you to come back, and, and is it you know more appealing to do two instead of one? And, and, and that, that was appealing to me, just to feel like I could, I could leave a, a larger fingerprint for, for better on, on the show. Because, again, I, you know, we, I was happy with how the pilot turned out and wanted to feel like, at the very least, we keep that tone and look going and um <clears throat> yeah two and three were were really interesting because you know we had 30 days to do the pilot and then in series we had eight days per episode so we had 16 days to shoot two and three together so not a lot of time but twice the content it's the equivalent of shooting feature film in 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 16 days which is right you know, crazy. And if you're not a production person out there, you know, for uh, even a movie like Celeste and Jesse, which was a tiny, tiny movie, we had 22 days, you know, um, for the age of Adeline, I had 40 days, you know, so to put it in perspective, to have 16 days to shoot essentially the same amount of content is, is enormously challenging. And at the same time, we're, we're building sets. So all of, you know, all of the locations that were in the pilot, the, the vast majority of the kind of hero locations now have to be built on stage, right? You don't want to be going into a high school three days a week for nine months. It's just not possible, right? What school's going on? You don't, you know, uh, you don't want to go into the Archie or Betty's house 
all the time. It's too expensive and not practical. So <clears throat> we're building all of these things on on stage. And um, and again, J.B. Mornville, our line producer, who sadly passed, did did a wonderful job. They not only built, or excuse me, bought on stage uh, out in Langley, um, but they also you know retrofitted it to be equipped to build stages and offices and I'm getting lost in some boring weeds here but but um, it was challenging to, to the point where <clears throat> we were scheduling all of the stuff in Riverdale High at the very end of the schedule because the department needed every single day possible to get that stuff done and even when we came in to shoot the hallway anything inside Riverdale High in 102 103 um the paint was drying on the walls, literally. So it was like, we'd be shooting, and you'd be telling the actors, like, ooh, don't don't lean on the wall. The paint's still drying. <laughs> so it was, um, no, and that's not totally uncommon for the beginning of a series, but sure. but it, it was sort of an additional, um, you know, a, a complication, and one that I hadn't really, on the, the past pilots I've done, even though they've gone to series, I've not continued on, and so <clears throat> I'd never sort of seen that firsthand, and so it was uh, it was challenging for me too, as as somebody who likes to really prep everything uh, in detail. I'm trying to shot list um, all of my coverage uh, in in pre production, and and it's very hard to do that when you haven't seen the location. And where I'm all I'm doing is putting it on on Eric, our production designer, on his. Um, sketches you know what i mean i, I or i walk on stage and it would be it would be stuck at ghana like okay here's this is going to be the riverdale one of the riverdale highs hallways you know and, and that's it <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it was it was using some imagination for sure no absolutely <laughs> and having had the uh pleasure myself of talking to most of the cast um, you are, and, and I think that stems from being one, the kind of person that you are, but also having been there in the infancy for everyone, you know, right. you were as much a part of their lives and of that, that initial group as any of the other cast members. So it wound up being such, especially for them, I imagine for you as well, such a, uh, you know, a homecoming, so to speak, for yeah, you to, for you yeah, to return for, sure. for the fin season finale for sure I, yeah i mean i look i'm i'm i love the cast of this show i really do there's not a bad apple in the bunch um i'm and and so to come back for the finale to sort of and that was it was almost a year after having done the pilot so you know they've gone off and shot an entire season and and um, you know just to get back up there, see them, see how they sort of changed, evolved, and uh, you know really sort of taken ownership over the role in, in new ways. Uh, all of that was really exciting, but it was also just nice to kind of get together and go, hey, we we all got together and set out to create something we we were excited about and could be proud of, and 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 we did that, you know, and and here we are and wrapping up season one. It was it was certainly a a really special feeling. Um, you know, one thing I'll, I'll quickly just mention is, you know, for Casey Cott, um, who plays, of course, Kevin Keller, and um, Camila Mendez, who who plays Veronica, uh, you know, the, 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 those two actors, they had both done a fair bit of theater in New York, but neither one had ever acted on camera before, ever. And so uh, just, just it's, it's worth noting that if you go back and look at the pilot, the very first setup of the very first day on the pilot was Betty and Veronica walking down the hallway talking about Riverdale High. Betty's giving Veronica the kind of the tour, as it were. Right. And Kevin swoops in and, and talks a bit more about the town. And Veronica says, you're gay, thank God, let's be best friends. Right. That was the very first shot of the very and And Lily, who plays Betty, of course, Lily Reinhardt, you know she she's she's one of the more experienced of the younger cast members. But that day, I got there and I, I, I turned to Jim Brebner, the first AD I work with up there a lot, and I said, Jim, what the hell were we thinking? Scheduling first setup, first day. Two of the three actors seen have never acted on camera before. They've never had to hit mark. They don't know, you know, 
uh, they don't know how to find their light. You know, all these little sort of technical things that actors pick up having been on television shows and movies like these guys have never done. And I got to say, for all three of them, but but Cammy and and Kevin, uh, excuse me, Casey in particular, you know, they were they it was literally like they had both been on a show for ten years. I mean, they were perfect from the very first take. Totally nailed it every single time. And it, so it was very, very bizarre. But this is a very long way of getting to coming back for the finale and seeing how, you know, those actors who had, who, this was their first job on screen, had grown and had become so savvy to the process. Hmm. That was really exciting to see, too. And I felt, you know, a little, you know, paternal in a way that, that you know, my kids had sort of grown up and and, and are now on the show together. So anyway, that, that was um, that was sort of a nice part of it as well. No, it's great. And, and it's it's so funny for for cause I don't even think I mean, I'm sure I saw the dailies come in on that first day of shooting. But but to think back, to, I know exactly the scene we're talking about to think back as yeah. that that being the first day of shooting and the comfort level that they had with each other, yeah. uh, even if it was fabricated, <laughs> was so great. I mean, there's instant chemistry between all of those kids. Yeah, no. They, they, and again, that's that's a credit to them and, and David Rappaport, um, David and Lindsay who cast the show. And, um, you know, they, 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 they were just great from the word go, you know? Uh, so that, that's, that's all them. And, and, and again, I, I count my blessings that it, it happened that way. So you must be a little excited for the fact that, uh, it has been, uh, it's going to get a second season. Of course. I mean, are you kidding? It's, it's you know, and a full a full sort of season order. It sounds like, and yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I'm you know, I'm I'm excited for all of them. I'm excited for Roberto. You know, nobody is more deserving in this town of success than he is. I mean, you, could, you couldn't find a more you know talented, lovely gentleman than, than he is. And um, and I'm thrilled for for all of them. And. Uh, you know, also is just as as a fan of the show, excited to see where where it goes. Totally. All right, so let's get into it. This is episode thirteen, the sweet hereafter. Yeah. Um. So t- towards the top of the show in Act One, uh, over at the sheriff station, uh, Sheriff yep. Keller tells the Jones that FP will remain in jail unless he gives up Serpent's names. Back over to uh, Riverdale High, uh, Veronica and Archie are debating telling Betty about their pending romance that we're sort of dancing around now yeah yeah that that was that was a fun one and originally a much longer scene but um but uh wanted to do a bit of a a long steady camp move there it had been written that they were the two of them had found you know a, a quiet alcove to um tuck away in and, and, and have this discussion and i said to roberto early on i was like it's pretty long it's longer in the script. I think, I, I think it's going to get a little stale if we're just, you know, looking at white walls. If they're in an alcove, what do you would say we do this on the move? And they find themselves in the student lounge, and it's early enough that nobody's in there. And I had, <laughs> I had wanted to do, and actually in my cut there was a little callback to um, episode two where uh, Archie gets body slammed into the uh, vending machine, <laughs> and. Um, and there's a little callback to it that got that we we ended up taking out for time. But um, if they ever release a, an extended cut, you'll you'd see it. But 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 this is again a, a, a you know why Roberto's so great is that he's very open to the process and not too precious about it. He said, yes, that sounds great. You know, just make sure it feels sort of clandestine. This conversation is sort of in secret. So. Um, so that that's sort of how it evolved into a, a walk and talk of sorts. <laughs> that's great. Over at the principal's office, Mayor McCoy is going to recruit Betty and Archie for the Jubilee. Uh, yeah. Yep. And, and sorry, I'm, I'm I'm probably interjecting too much, Bob. No, not at all. If we 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 run out of time here, but um, uh, the the blocking in this is supposed to be a reversal of the blocking in 102 at the end of the episode when Betty and Jughead are at the in the in the um, Riverdale Register. Sorry, not the Riverdale Register, the Blue and Gold. Um, right, right. Uh, they're in the Blue and Gold offices and they're and Dilton has come in with a confession. Um it was it was supposed to be a little reversal of of that again not anything that anyone will notice other than me but but i felt <laughs> like well if i'm going to come back i might as well do 
you know, try and bookend some of these things that we did early in the season. So totally. um, for those real real de- devotees, you can take a look at that. <laughs> no, this is great. This is a lot of a lot of Easter eggs people can go back and check out. That's right. Um, uh, then uh, in that same scene, so then, then Betty, Veronica, Archie, and Kevin and Jughead are going to air their grievances and their baggage. This is all great stuff at the top of the episode. And this is where Veronica... Lowers the boom, sort of, on Betty, who seems uh, kind of yeah, over it. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, when I read this this scene for the first time, it I, it occurred to me that okay, here's another, you know, lunch table scene, which you know we did in the pilot, and we did in 102. I don't remember if there's one on one. You know, there's, there's, throughout the, the the show, there's a lot of these, and and I just the thought of doing another, you know, they take forever you know to cover everybody <laughs> sure. and they're not very from a creative standpoint they can be pretty um pretty stale feeling where you're just kind of slowly moving the camera around the table to cover everybody and there's not it's sort of you know, all right now it's your close-up and you say your lines you know it's, it's it can be a little dry and so <clears throat> i want to do this thing certainly not a new concept at all but where we we just dolly around them and we try and time it so that we're picking up these little pieces and reaction shots as we dolly around the table and and I know that Roberto saw it and and like hated it at first in the cutting room and I felt terrible but I but I think ultimately he came around to to uh, to liking a a truncated version of it and you know I, I I certainly am fond of it. Well, what it does is it adds a lot of excitement to a lot of information as we are kind of coming off of all of the conclusive elements that happen in 12 and right. kind of are establishing where we are after that. And, you know, where is 13? You know, what's interesting about episode 13 in this season is that by and large, all of the, the, the murder mystery aspect has been solved already. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and, where and do I, you go? I, yeah, and I was, and when Roberto told, I mean, when I had, I had a call with him before he, I think they had even turned in a script for 112, and I, <clears throat> I was assuming that they were going to reveal Jason's killer in 113, and I was excited about that. And then sure. when he told me he was going to be in 112, I was a little nervous because I just said, well, what, what's 113 going to be about? The sort of engine of the season has suddenly been taken away you know you've resolved the big mystery what's the engine to the show right. and he explained what he wanted to do and it made a lot of sense and um but this scene in particular freaked me out just because it's sort of a horrific amount of exposition that you're unloading you know what i mean yeah. a, a wrap up plus exposition for this episode and it's sort of it could be one of those scenes where you just you get bored to tears not because the writing's not great it certainly is but there's just a lot of data that you're you're unloading on the audience and and trying to make that visually interesting and also keep up a little bit of the you know suspense for lack of a better word it seemed like a moving camera like this would feel a little bit you know just a little bit more kinetic and a little bit more interesting than than it would if we were just sort of doing you know static close ups of each of them as we did it in the pilot or one of two um it felt a little bit more compelling <clears throat> that way. Um, and also there's Jughead, I, I think it made the cut, Jughead has, had a line where he says, you know, this isn't the wire. And I thought it would be sort of a fun <laughs> tip to kind of do a move that felt more like the West Wing or the wire Definitely. than it did Riverdale, if that makes any sense. No, absolutely. And, and it does lend itself, you're right. I mean, that could very easily be another kind of talking head sitting at the cafeteria stationary camera shot. Uh, yeah. And instead, what you do is add so much energy to that scene just by moving the camera. Well, thanks. Hopefully, hopefully it works for, for those of you out there when you see it. <laughs> yeah, that was the that was the goal. And anyway. if it doesn't take a drama, I mean, you'll be fine. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> All right, into uh, the the Blossom Barn. Cheryl haunts her father's death spot. Yeah. This was the first day, the very first day of shooting 113. It was the end of, of the very first day, and we only had this barn for a very short amount of time. And uh, so we kind of raced through this scene a bit. And But I actually really liked the way it, it came out. And um, Stephen Jackson, the series DP who did 102 through 113, I think did a really great job 
uh, lighting this. I had told him I wanted something. I'd, I'd shown him some images from uh, Fox Catcher, the, the Bennett Miller movie um, sure. that Greg Frazier shot, which I love, and it's just a beautiful looking movie. And, you know, there's some things that takes place in a stable and, and um, you know, a kind of big manner. And I showed him some stills, and he. Stephen was a long a gaffer for very many many years before becoming a DP and and was like oh, okay got it you know he sort of <laughs> to the point and but but totally nailed it and so I, I actually really like the way this scene came together and 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 incidentally the scene was not the act break in the in the uh, in the script and I and I wanted to make it the act break in my cut and I'm glad it it, it stayed as the act break because it's a much more sort of suspenseful way to go out. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, that takes us into Act Two, over at Riverdale High. Betty and Archie are talking about relationships, and is Archie happy? You know, this is probably this is probably my favorite scene in the episode, and I and I as much as I love how Sweetwater River came together, this is my favorite scene because to me this is this is speaks to the core of of Archie and 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 really what I think people if this show Knockwood is successful enough to go on for, you know, more than just season two, what people are really going to be interested in, regardless of what the mystery is, you know, is this love triangle and, and specifically the love connection between Betty and Archie, which is sort of, you know, boy next door, girl next door, first love, um, unrequited love, all, all that stuff that I think everyone has some attachment to growing up. Um, and 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 I'll also say this is KJ's very last scene of the season that we saved this for the for I think it was uh, both it was our last day. And wow. um, uh, Lily had some more stuff to shoot with Cole, which we'll get into later. But but this was KJ's last scene, and and he just absolutely knocks it out of the park here, and is so sweet and so tender, and and makes it so complicated in those close ups where. You know, there's there's so much going on. So so for me, you know, shooting something simple as as this scene, but with so much going on under the surface of what's being said, is is as interesting, if not more interesting than um, than shooting the big sort of Sweetwater River set piece, which is also a lot of fun, but more <clears throat> more fun from just a technical perspective. Whereas this is fun just to watch these two young actors do such a great job with the material and really get into the minutia of what you know what is going to make this this little scene sing and and they're they're so great here so yeah, yeah. this is this would be my favorite Definitely. Um, that's a great i love the idea that that was his his you know he that was his rap day that's a great scene to end on no it was and and he did such a just a good feeling to fit there and and of course he did uh, such a smart and you know we did finished his close up and, and wrapped him and you know he gave this really moving speech and everybody was <laughs> up it was it was just a great uh, uh, uh something i won't forget you know it was no, really lovely great. then on to the andrews construction trailer where uh, hermione asks fred to sell and fred gives her shoots up straight make me a mean offer <laughs> uh this is great you know i'm a little bit about this sticking in the show because Again, it's one of this sort of like it's like the C story going on. It's not the main driver, and I was worried about it living. But you know, Luke and Marisol, who are two of the nicest human beings on the planet, um, and such pros make it maybe even more compelling than it has any right to be. It's certainly not my coverage that's compelling. I, I mean, I remember <laughs> this was. Excuse me. This is the last. This is the last scene of of our day. I don't remember what day, but I know it was the last scene of the day because we had maybe two hours to shoot this scene. It was it was very little time, and I told Luke and Marcel, I said, "Listen, guys, I'm so sorry. We got we got held up earlier. That we're going to have to jam through this." And you know, they've been doing it lo long enough to know. You know, all right, got it. No worries. Let's let's do it. Let's fucking you know, let's yeah. nail it. And and they do. You know, they're they're not. They they don't get they don't get overly finicky. They go, okay, what's the scene about? What are we doing? What kind of blocking are you seeing? And and we just jam through it. And so you know, this is a and and a testament to both of them who are just such seasoned pros that they know what they need to do to to elevate the scene and and know that hey this the episode's not totally about this it you know yes this is a runner but it's not the a story right. how do we make it really compelling and make people you know hooked on this as well and and they're no one's better than they are at doing that 
No, absolutely. And it does take seasoned, I, I think you'd attest to this too, seasoned television actors in particular to know you can't be too precious about individual scenes. Things change all the time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so they were, you know, they were great. And, and, and also just, it's a little, little, not to get too lost on this, but little technical things like, you know, they, <clears throat> they knew that the scene would have to really move and have a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of pep to kind of a stand a chance of making the cut, but also for it to be to kind of move the story. You're you're early in the second act and you want to make sure the story is picking up momentum, not losing momentum. And so, you know, they were they gave the scene a lot of urgency, which which I think helped a lot as well. Definitely. Uh, over at City Hall, Archie and Josie discuss music for the Jubilee. Uh, Josie likes the song, but uh, needs to do the, her own thing at the Jubilee. Yep, uh, Archie and 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 uh, uh, Ashley. Sorry, Josie at the Jubilee. Um, this was um, interestingly enough. So, are, are we allowed to talk about KJ's broken hand? Uh, yeah, absolutely. As far as okay. I know, I haven't been told I can't. <laughs> Okay. Well, well, for now, you'll 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 double check on that. But I, I'm you know so so KJ, um, as we'll get into later, um, broke his hand while shooting the the set piece um, at Sweetwater River in this episode, and we'll get into that when we get there. And 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 luckily, he had shot most of the pieces that followed that already. But this was one of the pieces that he hadn't shot. So in other words, we'd always. In that sequence, we had the story was that he punches the ice and he breaks his hand, and the rest of the episode will have a cast on. Right. Of course, in like any production, you're not shooting in order, and so this was one of the scenes that we hadn't yet shot, but we'd done the Sweetwater River scene the night before, and KJ had to come to set with a cast on, with a real cast on, and so if you look closely, the the way KJ is holding his jacket is really designed to hide the fact that. Um, he he has a cast on his arm, and and even the blocking by putting KJ on the right side of frame and, and Ashley on the left side of frame in the wide was done so that you know KJ's right side would be hidden um, uh, in in the wide. Uh, so you know the little weird things like that, but um, uh, about this scene, and and I actually really like this scene. It's not a long one, but um, I think KJ's great, and you know Ashley who I think, <clears throat> if, if anything, uh, you know, is underserved in, in some episodes just because of time or whatever. You know, she always does, she's one of those actresses that just that does a great job even when given kind of limited real estate. And this is a great illustration of her, you know, doing the little subtle things with about her mom and, and the way she delivers that line yeah. about how she picked it, you know, gives you some 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 insight into her world and her home life with her mom and that could have been just such a kind of a throwaway thing so um anyway i I love i love what the two of them do here absolutely uh the riverdale register alice and hal reject betty's article and warn of changing times right um well this particular scene um was a lot of fun just for me because a i think lily is is such an incredible actress but yeah. um it, it's also fun to see machen uh dig in with her a little bit i mean even from the pilot it was clear that those two were going to have a really combustible sort of relationship and and i think in roberto in his wisdom it's a great way to sort of tee up the stakes for the the rest of the episode in a way that is 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 sort of deceiving. It's a little bit of a misdirect. I don't think you know necessarily right off the bat that you're going to be the stake for the episode. It all sort of comes back to this. So um, you know, it, it was a it was a fun little scene and a fun little way to sort of play, you know, a, a detective scene as it were. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I and you sort of uh, made mention of it there, but these women across the board, and I've had the extreme pleasure of at this point interviewing all of our leading ladies, and they uh, are incredible actresses on the screen, and we can all tell that, but just like really decent, good people. Yeah, no, I mean, that's true across the board with this whole cast. I mean, I, I didn't mention Lachlan Monroe, who, who plays... Hal Hooper, of course. Um, 
you know, I mean, just everyone across the board is just really, really lovely. That's why it's it's impossible to say no when they ask you to come back because <laughs> you just look forward to spending time with this, these families, you know, or just the Riverdale family is 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 uh, you know as good as as it gets. It's really it's really wonderful. I'm hoping that the season two doesn't become so big uh, that they all get burnt out because yeah. even when I went back for, for this, this finale, the, the, these guys just loved each other even more than they did on the pilot and had grown, you know, so much closer, but yeah, just a wonderful group of people. It's uh, it was, they're not always that way. And very lucky in this exactly. case. Exactly. Well, and they think they think the world of you, it came up in, I think all of my interviews, especially with, you know, they, they formed su- such a huge bond with you on the pilot, which is which is such an exercise. And then to come back and yeah. do two and three back to back and then to like yeah. finish it off with the finale. I mean, it, what a great way to to kind of wrap up the first season. Yeah, no, it, it was it was really it was really a joy. Um, and, and, and look, I feel the same way about those guys. I mean, they, they put a lot of trust in me. And as I mentioned, I think earlier, you know, for for a lot of them, Cammy and and Casey, for instance, their their first on camera jobs, and then you know, for a number of the other actors of from the sort of younger cast members, you know, it, it wasn't their first jobs, but they hadn't done a, a lot of work, and right. so you know, I think they're really looking for a, a captain, for lack of a better word, and you know, I I'm more of a fan of say. You know, I'm I'm a little bit from the Cameron Crowe, Hal Ashby school of directing, where I like a very even 72 degrees on set, and I like my actors to feel safe and comfortable because I think the majority of people do their best work when they feel that way, not when they feel vulnerable and exposed. And and acting is a job that um, is scary even in the best of circumstances, and you feel vulnerable and exposed no matter what. So you know, I like creating a safe environment. I think. For the younger cast members, especially who were, I think, very nervous um, for a lot of them, their first pilot, uh, and 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 for some of them, their first job, it, it was it was just a good match, and um, and I really you know loved and appreciated the the fact that they put so much of their faith in in my hands. No, that's great, and and in fact, that brings us to a really interesting part here, and we're gonna pause pause our uh, making our way through the through the beats here to, to discuss this, you know, you, you mentioned comparing yourself or your style to Hal Ashby and, and others. Um, that's actually a really interesting question. So how much rehearsal do you like? And directors and actors are all come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. And I know people have a different amount that they like to do. And sometimes it differs based on the project, but for you in Riverdale, what, what was the, what was the rehearsal project like? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, you know, my my position on this has sort of evolved over the years, and the the first thing I'll say is that when when in series, so for one hundred two, one hundred three, and then the finale one thirteen, there really isn't any time to do any rehearsal. I mean, for one hundred two, one hundred three, we had a little, you know, we're prepping the same way you would a pi- the pilot, and you know, with the pilot, we got a little bit of time to rehearse. Um, 102, 103 less, and the finale zero because they're shooting 112 while I'm up there prepping 113, right? But but back to sort of the, the question, my style uh, with rehearsal has evolved to the point where I like to sit down and and just sit or at a table with the actors in a particular scene that is a bigger scene, performance heavy. Uh, or difficult technically, and sit and and read through it together and talk about it, and not necessarily run through the specifics of blocking. Right. Um, and, and occasionally I'll do that if there's technically something difficult or unique about the scene. But um, what I have found, and and maybe this is people actors out there might be shaking their head, but <laughs> what I have found is that when I try and run a blocking and rehearsal. A lot of actors, not all, not not all of them, but but many of them feel like, okay, this is our time to, for me to kind of say that I want this kind of blocking or that kind of blocking. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, well, a lot of them have good ideas, and I, and I do my best to remain open 
to those ideas, they have to remember that I'm I'm shooting the show in a very specific way. Right. It's a visual medium, and I have to tell the story with camera as well. And and there's a lot that goes into where I put the camera, and it's it, I've spent hours and hours and hours thinking about it, and then that work gets moved over to Steve Jackson, the series DP, or, or David Landsberg, my, my DP who shot the pilot with me, and we talk about the light, and we talk about where grip and electric equipment is going to be. Now, I know I'm getting very sort of technical and probably boring a lot of people out there, but a lot of the, the, the gear, as it were, the grip and electric lights, for lack of a better word, um, might be sitting on a 135-foot condor three blocks away. Right. And that's the kind of decision that has to be made weeks in advance so that we can tell the location department we want to put a condor here and the grip and electric department that they need to run power to that. So, so there's a lot of these things that need to be put into place well before we get there on the day. In other words, when we get there on the day, it's not really – time for the actor to say, I just want to explore the blocking. Some filmmakers do it that way and just sort of say, let's see what the actors do and I'll follow them. I I don't care for that kind of filmmaking because to me, it's it, it tends to be a little bit lazy with camera. And I think that, you know, you watch the work of, say, Paul Thomas Anderson, for instance, and there's this beautiful poetry between blocking and performance and camera where it all looked really effortless and seamless and and that's always what I'm going for I'm I'm, I'm always thinking about performance when I'm designing coverage but um and I'm I know I'm <laughs> giving you the very long-winded no. answer but the, but the but the, the to sort of put a button on this the the reality is for me it's more important nowadays to walk through the words and in sitting down and we'll read it we'll really perform it um, and occasionally, again, if there's something tech technically difficult or technically specific about it, we'll run through a kind of a rough blocking of it. But the rehearsal for me is much more about hearing the words, talking about the intent here, talking about what we're trying to achieve, um, uh, imagining the... the um, timber of the scene as it relates to the rest of the episode, etc., more so than it is, I'm going to walk through the blocking, because the reality is, nine times out of ten, I have a very specific idea about the blocking, and and it's it's crucial that we do that so that it fits into what I want to do technically with camera, and that is really telling our story visually, not doing a play, right? So, um, and look, there's, there's many times where an actor says, look, I have a problem with this, and here's why, and they provide a really sound argument for why the blocking should be different. I go, you know what? You're right. Let's make an adjustment, and we make that adjustment. But generally speaking, it has to be a very sound argument that they've clearly really thought out because I've had actors on the day go, I don't want to stand here. I want to stand over here. And there's no, there's no basis for the argument. It's just sort of, they want to have it their way. And, you know, I know I mentioned how Ashby and Cameron Crowe on the other end of that spectrum is somebody like David Fincher, who's a little bit more, I think, militant in his directing style from what I gather. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, you know, and you, you, you can hear him on commentary and, and interviews that, no, 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 I've spent months thinking about the blocking and months yeah. thinking about where camera is going to be to, to capture that performance and that blocking in the, in the best way possible in the most sort of visually, um, uh, a significant way possible, and and so don't tell me that, that this idea that just came to you on the fly is is worth its salt. You know, it it might be that you thought about it and okay, let's consider it and let's discuss it and maybe we make some changes. It's not totally locked down, but again, you have you have to say something really well thought out and profound for me to consider changing. Uh, the the movement of the scene does does that make sense? Uh, no, absolutely, and, and the reality of it is as well. And you know this, it's television. You you have only eight days to shoot basically an hour <laughs> forty minutes of television. <laughs> yeah, well that's that's the the other big the big thing that you, that I left out, of course, is yes, in series where we have eight days, and I think we had thirteen or fourteen for this pilot. But right. yeah, in eight days, you don't really have time no. the way pilot or feature to to kind of you know play jazz as i like to say or explore it a little bit because there the reality is it's just the, the machine has to move so fast to 
to get the words on the page that you know and and that's and that truly that's one of the sort of more unfortunate things about about series directing is that you know you're you're in just a constant battle with with the clock and right. and oftentimes you have to collapse coverage and consolidate your blocking or simplify it just because well, I have this great blocking plan, but it's going to require five setups, and I have time for two. Um, let's change it so that I can actually um, capture these moments and 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 work on performance and and give ourselves a real fighting chance to make our day. So yeah, yeah. that's another obviously big component of it. You're absolutely right. Well, and then and then to add insult to injury, then when you are able to like pull off these masterful feats of you know cinema more or less then you wind up taking it to the cutting room and of course it has to be yeah, whittled down about. to 42 <laughs> minutes right yeah no it is it can be admittedly it can be a bit soul destroying because you know on the rare occasion that you do plan for something a bit like that it's a bit more of a you know a, a visual flourish or or something that feels a, a bit unique or or you know, uh, something that you feel like adds a moment that wasn't necessarily on the page before, and you feel, boy, this is great, and, and look at, you know, this little nuance is really going to help tell our story, and, and on on rare occasion it does, and then you go, well, we don't have time for it, because you're kind of constrained to what is, you know, somewhat an artificial time, this 42 minutes to, to right. build around uh commercials <laughs> yeah. so I, I know that really crass way of looking at it but but it is it is the reality and and so you know i mean i will say on the, on the flip side of that just as an argument you know for the medium that that you know what it has taught me is is how to be really economical with with my storytelling you know and right. and there's so often you get in the cutting room and you know you get your cut down to like 48 minutes and you're six minutes over and you're going there is just not a single frame i can pull out of this it's just as tight as it can be there's no yeah. way and then you end up finding one other thing and you go oh it still works and then one more thing and it still works i mean steven soderbergh talks about this all the time that he likes to do like a gut pass he guts his movies you know he gets he he'll cut you know, I think he cut Solaris, for instance, down to like 72 minutes. Oh, my gosh. And James James Cameron, who was a producer on that movie, said, I, I think you've gone too far. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, like, and that movie still is like 95 minutes. It's not a long movie, but, <clears throat> but it's actually sort of a healthy exploration. And I think it's improved uh, my ability as a storyteller and just going, okay, how, what is the most economical version or sometimes you'll shoot you know you'll be on set and you'll you'll the actors you know it's first thing in the morning or it's the end of the day and people are tired you'll just go you know what let's just shoot a double time take let's just do every everybody's just saying the lines double time and we're just going to do a camera move double time everything's double time yeah. and and lo and behold it's funny how you'll often find yourself okay well there's that little moment where she did it really quickly and it actually was really funny that way or it kind of helped the energy of the scene you'll end up using a line or using a little move or something from that double time take and and that's something i don't think i necessarily would have you know i was doing when i was um doing sort of feature to feature before i started breaking up with television and so right. it, it's it's been a nice sort of helpful little tool well, and, and it's absolutely and it's it is, you know, that the medium of broadcast television is is without a doubt one of the more challenging, in, in my opinion. But it also teaches you and, and not only for the director, but for the producers and the writers and everyone that you can't be precious. I'm certainly, <laughs> certainly not. Right. Not in broadcast television. No, it is the. uh the worst medium for being precious that's for sure <laughs> so we're going to jump back in in here into act two so over at the riverdale high a girl's locker room cheryl's going to give up the vixens to veronica she has lost the, you know I, uh, uh, yeah i i i had i admit i i actually had cut this scene in my cut that i turned over to roberto um not because I didn't like it, but just be, again, as, as we go back to the conversation about time, because of time, and and I'm really glad that it found its way back in, just because it helps track uh, Madeleine's story, Cheryl's story, so much right. better. You know what I mean? Cheryl's story really tracks 
it, the, the slow evolution of her kind of downward spiral is is much clearer with this moment. And and there was, I will just say, for the real diehards out there, there was a in the in the script originally before we went to camera, there was a version of this actually happening at the cheer practice. Um, and this is kind of a little insight into sort of again that eight day merciless it is, but um, the the locker room is a, is a set uh, built on our stage, and the the gym is of course an actual gym that, where we did the pilot and where we, the show occasionally goes back to at a real high school, and um, <clears throat> we just in our schedule we couldn't get back to that. We just couldn't get to the gym. There was only so many moves we could make in our in our little schedule and we just couldn't get back there so we had to put this in the locker room which is a little unfortunate because it the scope of the scene is obviously smaller Mm -hmm. but um but but at the same time i think it it provides a level of intimacy to the scene that it wouldn't have had otherwise and 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 for that i'm I'm glad that it ended up there and, and i'm glad that um it remained in the cut Definitely. Back over to the Cooper house in Betty's bedroom. Veronica and Betty discuss the town's dark side. Decide to bring Polly to school. <laughs> I um I love this scene just because I love Lily and Cammy together always. Oh, yeah. They're they're so wonderful. Um, and and uh, I also love shooting on this particular set. I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but. Um, or I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but but there, but this is a stage that you know we we uh, this set we built for the pilot, and then we moved over to our new stages, and so it's it's sort of this vestige of the pilot, which I really like coming back to, and um, uh, you know the two of them are just so excellent together. It was this was my my first opportunity to work with Tiara, who plays Polly, and um, she was she's so wonderful and so beautifully cast as as Betty's older sister. I mean, seeing Lily and Tira next to each other is sort of chilling. I mean, they really do look so eerily uh, alike. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it was, it was a fun little scene. Again, I always love coming back to the set and, um, I love these three girls together. Cammy and, and Lily in particular are just always wonderful to watch together. And, and this was, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of doing sort of a double time take, this was a, a great, uh, uh, example of that. I mean, we shot this early uh, in the morning towards the end of the schedule, and everybody was pretty exhausted, and some of the sort of double-time stuff made it into, um, uh, you know, when she's turning the computer around. The, <laughs> the thing we were joking about a lot was with the, the bit with the toenails, was that this was going to be like Quentin Tarantino's favorite scene of the series, because he loves <laughs> He loves toes. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but that was the uh, that was that was a bit of the joke. There was also, I think, um, it was right around Valentine's Day or right before Valentine's Day, and Lily and Cammy did a great little Valentine's Day video that um, made it onto the the World Wide Web. But they did that yes. in between setups of this scene. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we saw that all over uh, Twitter and Facebook everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it was uh, made the rounds, I think. <laughs> so back over to the Andrews house. We're going to end Act 2 with uh, social services arriving for Jughead. So Fred's got the uh, DUI, and there's a cash issue, and the deal is he's going to transfer to the south side by the end of the week. Yeah. Um, loved uh, love this scene. This is, this is a, at the end of a long day for us, and... Um, I'm forgetting the young lady who played the social services worker. I'm, I'm, forgive me, I'm forgetting her first name, but she was absolutely wonderful. And we had to really motor around. As you can see, there's a lot of coverage in this scene. There's just a lot of setups we're doing and uh, to kind of cover everybody's little reactions. And, of course, the, the conversation between Fred and Archie and, and Fred and the social social worker and then the social worker and Jughead and the looks between Jughead and and, and Archie, so there's a lot of different little moments to play, and so a lot of coverage to get to. And um, she was really great about just moving through it quickly. And, and again, back to our conversation about what a wonderful cast this is. I just love, love, love working with these guys. I yeah. mean, Luke and KJ and Cole are as professional and prepared and easygoing and wonderful as they come. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And so, you know, when they get to the set for this scene, I go, guys, I'm a little behind. I'm sorry. We've got, you know, X amount of hours to do this and I need 
two more hours than we have. You forgive me, but we're going to have to kind of crank through this. And they go, great, we're going to do it. It's it's going to be fantastic. And they just get in there and they nail it. So, um, you know, that's why it's it's so enormously helpful to have actors who are wonderful and prepared and professional. It makes my job easier and, and a lot more enjoyable. That's oh, for sure. Definitely. definitely. At the top of Act 3, at the sheriff's station, Archie tries to convince FP to take the deal. FP says he's going to uh, he'll survive but Archie should look out for him. Yeah. Um, there's a little shot at the top of this scene, I'll just point out, that was not scripted, and it was getting a lot of heat for wanting to shoot this little piece because it was a really busy day, and I'm really glad I fought for it because I love the little shot of Archie running into the um, the, the, into the jail, and, and um, uh, it, it's just a fun little way to kind of get us into the act. But uh, the scene itself... Um, you know, again, another actor, my first time, Skeet, wasn't in the pilot or 102, 103, and right. so it was my first time working with Skeet Ulrich. And, you know, I think for people my age, you know, I grew up on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, he he was an idol. I was really excited to, to work with him. He's so lovely, so prepared, such a hardworking guy. And um, we had a, a had a real blast, and it was it was fun to see KJ working with him because I hadn't seen that before. And and Skeet approaches every scene with with such an intensity, and I mean that in in the way of he's so serious about getting it right, and he's he's he he's it's so important to him the work. I mean, he's a guy who shows up, and not only does he know his lines, he knows everyone else's lines, Amazing. and he's. He's one of these guys who's really dialed in before you get there, so you know he's going to give you fireworks. And and I and I watched KJ, you know, his game kind of raised by Skeet and his intensity in the scene. And, and KJ he pulls me aside after, and his Kiwi accent was so funny. He's like, Skeet's really good, huh? And I'm like, yeah, he's good. He's like, yeah, it makes me want to be better. I was like, yeah, man, I mean, you guys were great together. He's like, and then he kind of ran off, and I was like, that's so great, you know, yeah. when another actor doesn't isn't there to you know intimidate or, or or be a jerk but but that is actually you know raising everyone's game and wants to be you know the best for himself and for others and and is inspiring the other young actors and you know i mean luke luke does that machin does that marisol all, all of the sort of you know quote-unquote adult actors on the right. show um do that and skeet in particular so he's been a perfect addition to the show no, it's great, and it was such an interesting dynamic when he entered, um, and it's fun to see him kind of rub up against characters that he wouldn't otherwise, you know, in various, like yeah. we see at the party scene where he has this fantastic uh, sequence with um, with Machen at the, at mm -hmm. the pickup truck, and it's right. these two, there's no reason for the two of them to really be together. But the fact because of that and because they're so um, we're invested in their characters and they're so they're dense. Um, it's uh, it, it's such a it's it's really fun on screen. It's really a good time. Yeah, absolutely. No, they, I, I remember the scene you're talking about. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic together. So over at the Riverdale High, uh, Veronica and Jughead bond. Cheryl apologize, gives him a, uh, a brooch to pawn. Uh, Kevin drags yeah. Veronica and Jughead to Betty's locker. They catch Archie, and Betty's locker is trashed with the serpent slut on it. Well, um, really love both of these scenes and how they came together. The, the, the cafeteria scene was shot on a different day at, a, at, at an actual school with the cafeteria. We had, um, w which I always love, I and mean, I love shooting on location because you get the depth and, and production value and more extras, et cetera. Um, I, you know, I love the way that Madeline plays that scene, just um, in her being sort of very, she's so collected and measured in, in that moment that it's sort of more chilling than if she were falling apart and sort of telegraphing what's coming. So, um, as usual, she knocks it out of the park. And then, um, yeah, the moment in the, in the, uh, in the hallway, this is back on our stage, um, he discovers the blood on our locker. You know, this is a great example of what I was talking about earlier where, you know, I had, I don't know, half a dozen setups planned and I I was running out of time and had to condense my coverage. And, and that's what became this sort of, it was longer, but we had to trim it for time, this sort of pan across the faces and people taking pictures 
and then landing on 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 Lily uh, and Tierra's faces. They're reacting before you reveal the locker. So the idea being built the suspense a little bit of like what's everybody looking at, everybody taking photos of, and then landing on Lily's, you know, and she does such a great job, sort of shocked, heartbroken face. Um, you know, it, it, it's it again. A, Lily is, is the kind of actress who you go, Lily, I'm running out of time. I've got, you know, maybe two <laughs> or three takes of this. And, you know, I really want you to be emotional when, when the camera finally lands on you. And you know, I think people in drama school and, and and people wanting to, aspiring to act, you know, they, they don't, they, they, they tend to uh, not appreciate how hard it can. It's one thing to do it in class or, or in your car when you're getting ready for an audition. It's, you know, not easy there either. I don't, I'm not trying to undermine that. But, but when you go, all right, Lily, uh, we got 10 minutes to get this. Right. Camera's going to pan all the way across. You've got 40 extras behind you, and they're making noise, and they're moving around, and you've got the crew you're looking at. And when, right when we land on your face, I just want you to make sure your eyes are you're welled up and you're really, you know, you're really moved by it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. such a um, uh, unsexy, uh, it, it can be unsexy and rather technical in a very kind of crude way. Um, and, and you know, Lily is one of them that can just give it to you every time and knock it out of the park every time. No, no worries. But, um, and that's a real gift for me. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes all the, all the difference in the world though, that, that she has that relationship with, with you and that you are responding to her effort because that's also not typical. Uh, you know, no. uh, across the board, no. you know, you, you are, you know, uh, acting in front of the camera is frequently a brutal and thankless task <laughs> Yeah, no, in, in the question. moment. It winds up being great after the thing is done, but in the moment it, it can yeah. be brutal. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. Over to the Andrews house, uh, Fred and Archie have a little vent. Then, uh, yeah, I, you know, again, I, I, one of these days where we shot kind of all of the kitchen stuff together, and I was looking for uh, a little bit of a unique style of, of blocking, to make sure not all the scenes feel the same. Um, there, there's only so many ways you can shoot this kitchen. Um, <laughs> and 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 in my defense, we've had three different kitchens. I, I, this is maybe more. Uh, Trekky kind of nerdy information than no, anyone I, out there. That's needs, really interesting. But, I had no idea. This is the first time I'm hearing. But it. yeah, so so on the pilot, we had we had one house that was on location, and it wasn't across the street, but it was very near the actual Cooper exterior house. They're like two blocks apart, and we shot that you know with the porch and everything, and we shot for the for the pilot, and and it worked out great. Then I came back five months later or whatever for 102, 103 and um, uh, discover that the neighbors to Archie's house were not nice people and didn't want production there and yeah. were kind of kind of rude to our location team and basically made it impossible for us to shoot there. So part of 102, 103 was finding a house that looked the same, had the same porch because we had the porch scene and everything else. So, so if you watch 102, 103, that exterior is is what has become Archie's house in the show. Um, but we actually shot in that kitchen for uh, for 102 and 103. We shot the, in, the real location interior. And then when I came back for the finale, I discovered that they built the porch, the front facade, and the, the whole downstairs area of Archie's house on on the stage. So that third kitchen is is what you see here, which is mirrors the kitchens from episode two and three, That's but crazy. is you know significantly wider and and right. obviously walls that move and all the stuff that you kind of need for production. But um, but yes, it is a it is a different um, three sort of different kitchens I have to shoot. But if you look at the pilot, it's it's noticeably different. Some of the the layout of the the first floor. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's funny. Um, over at the Riverdale Graveyard, Betty and Jughead walk home and discuss the prank. Jughead feels the universe wants him to leave. I I love this little scene. Um, you know, Cole and Lily are, are wonderful in it. Um, we got very lucky that we showed up this morning, and it was it had snowed all night and was snowing, and and you know having overcast skies help us in terms of not fighting sunlight or chasing sunlight. Um, and, and, you know, we 
shot it we pretty quickly. Um, again, Lily and Cole were great and ready and were great together. Um, such chemistry, these two, I think you'd agree. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, they came up to me after we shot the whole scene. We were done. We were moving on to uh, some of the pool. And, and they said, you know, we really love that scene and doing that together. And I'm just afraid it's going to get cut. You know, the, <laughs> the episodes don't have enough time for this scene. I, and I said, I hear your concern. I'm going to fight to keep this in the show. And I, and I know that Roberto really loved it too. But um, well, I'm happy to see it in because it is one of those that isn't necessarily moving a lot of plot forward, but it's such a sweet, tender scene between the two of them. I think it was worth keeping. Absolutely, but it's also character building too, right? So it's it, absolutely it, it's developing. We're, we're seeing and yet some more development with with those characters and their relationship to each other. So it's I don't you never feel like it's time wasted. No, and 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 it, it also tees up you know the his move, uh, his move out of the Riverdale High a little bit. You know, right. I think you 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 wouldn't without that scene. It would it might feel a little bit out of the blue when he shows up at Southside High. You know? Totally. And that's such a swift sequence anyway, so you're absolutely right. To be able to sort of tee it up, as so to speak, uh, really does yeah. sort of make it in the forefront of your mind so that it, it isn't so whiplash uh, when it happens. Yeah. Uh, well, that's o- exactly right. Over at the Lodge apartment, Hermione tries to convince Veronica to manipulate Archie to sell. And she... Yeah, this was a, a, a tricky scene because I think, you know, for Marisol, um, uh, Hermione's journey over the first season, I think, evolved a little bit from where she was originally supposed to be going to where she ended up as it relates to Hiram and Fred. And, and I think Marisol was trying to walk a fine line in terms of what the backstory had been and where she was going and how manipulative she had been with Veronica. Um, over the course of the season, and and I think she does a, a great job of of walking that line. Um, and Cammy's, I think, lovely as far as feeling the trail of the person you're supposed to trust the most. Oh, absolutely! And she also gives a, gives a fantastic reading of as long as you're in control, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. brilliant sure. in the, in yeah, the moment, Shelley. Uh, over at the Cooper house in the living room, uh, Betty confronts her family about their secrets. Uh, I, um, I, I love this. I love, um, I love the, the little blocking here. This is sort of a David Finger move that I still sort of the, the pan of Lily walking in that sort of reveals, uh, reveals Machen and Tira on the couch there. Um, the only bummer about the scene is when we got there, we were ready to shoot. Um, and and we had snow falling outside, which <laughs> was only nice because I knew it was following the scene of of Lily and Jughead, of Lily and Cole walking in the graveyard. But, of course, we're shooting this like four days later. Right. And I'm going, oh, my God, we're lucky. She's going to come in the door, and we're going to see snow falling outside, and we're going to have that nice continuity there, um, which never happens. You know? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> And I was so excited. And something happened. I, I won't point fingers, but we ended up sitting there waiting uh, for actors to show up for like 45 minutes. And I just watched as the sun went down and oh. went down and went down and went down. And right as we were ready to roll, um, it was just dark and just completely too <laughs> dark to oh, see the outside, which was sort of soul crushing. But. Um, made up for by the fact that Machen and Tira and Lily are all really great in the scene, and um, you know I think it was a it was a, a it's a really nice act out and a great way to sort of end the act before coming in with this you know the big sort of apology from uh, from Alice in the in the at the top of the next act, which we haven't haven't seen her her do that. We haven't seen her be remorseful necessarily. You know? That's right. At the top of Act Four at the Blossom Manor, uh, Cheryl asks uh, her mom to stay home. This is a brutal sequence where Cheryl is sort of at her wits' ends, and uh, her mom replies, "I don't care." Yeah, really, really tough scene. This is the first day of our um, of one thirteen, and I admit I was feeling a little bit off. Older. I don't know what it was. Sometimes some days you have it, and some days you don't. I just was. There's something about. Um, uh, me that day, I just felt a little bit off, and I didn't quite get the coverage uh, I wanted to get. But um, you know, luckily Natalie and and Madeline are were so great yeah. uh, to get that uh, this team lived, and 
I was worried it was gonna wasn't gonna make the class. And I was, anyway, but they're lovely together. It is it is a really chilling between mother and daughter, and I think just kind of a fun um, reveal that that maybe Natalie uh, Natalie's character uh, is is really sort of behind. Behind the sort of, you know, the puppeteer to the Blossom family. Um, yeah. I just thought that, you know, that was sort of a fun, fun twist to play with. Absolutely. And then, of course, we're getting to the scene that you sort of teased about before at the Cooper house. Uh, Alice has her big confession and, and Betty learns she has a secret brother. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, this is the thing you get with Machen is just, you know, it's really wonderful moments and even in the rehearsal we rehearsed this a little bit on the day just to get the blocking and whatnot and she was already you know pretty emotional and yeah. <clears throat> we just said all right well we're gonna we're gonna start with your coverage while you've got all this worked up and, and lily was of course very supportive of that um you know and 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 she's just fantastic and it's it's so fun to kind of see a character who for a whole season's worth has been kind of merciless and cold and and uh, brutal, be really remorseful and and be tender and have that move, Betty, and, and, and also kind of start to understand where some of her more um, severe personality traits uh, came from, you know, from sort of a, uh, an incident like this. So, yeah, it, it, that was a moment to play, and I think, you know, Machen and, and, and Lily and I all felt really good about the work and... and um, and this is a scene we, we knew was going to be tough, and so we talked about it a lot and, and, and also carved out a little more time to shoot it than than others that, that sometimes get whipped through. Well, and, and the, the, the work was well worth it. The scene is spectacular. And, and you know, what Machen is able to do, I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, a character really having, someone who kind of lives in this sort of whirlwind and then all of a sudden gives it so much weight um, yeah, that is just tremendous. I mean, it really speaks to the direction, obviously, but also just the amount of skill that 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 she uh, has. Yeah, no, the, these both of these um, wonderful actresses have have that kind of extra gear, as it were, that that um, sometimes you need for scenes like these, and and are able to keep it up, take after take, and it's it's pretty awesome to watch and. You know, Machen is, and Lily, too, they're both so wonderful that they're the kind of people that can, you know, do a take like this, and then they step off and, you know, are laughing hysterically about something, and then, bam, they're right back in it right for back. another take, and, and it's equally as good. So they're, you know, they've got their <laughs> fine control of their instrument, as some people would say. I That's fantastic. I hate that expression, but <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Yeah. Over at the Riverdale Student Lounge, Betty updates Veronica and Archie about the secret brother. Yeah, you know, I, this, another scene, and it's kind of a recurring theme here, that we, were, we we shot at the very end of a long day. Everyone was exhausted, and um, I was I was tired myself, and I, I knew it was an important moment. And um, and, and this is, again, like sort of a double-time take, because everybody was falling asleep, and I go, we got to do a double-time thing just to kind of get the energy back up. There's no, no other reason than just to kind of feel the pace uh, or a, a quicker pace. And actually, we used a lot of that for Cammie's lines. You can see how fast she's sort of spitting those out. Not not elegant uh, way of describing direction, I realize, <laughs> but sometimes it's sort of a, a needed tool on the day. And, um, yeah, I mean... Look, it's it's a fun it's a fun little scene and kind of a, a good or, or a fun lead up to kind of a John Hughes moment of them breaking out of school and going to save Jughead at Southside High. Absolutely, and that's this next sequence. Jughead on the phone with Betty. Jug calls for the Southside, and the group heads out to fetch him. And absolutely, that is such a brilliant John Hughes Breakfast Club moment of them sort of slip sliding running down the hallway. Yeah, I, and actually, I don't think there was anything scripted for that, but I, I, I pitched it to Roberto that they should be, you know, running down the hall as sort of a nice, trans, fun, you know, music up, transitional yep. moment, and, and he really liked that idea. I actually had Principal Weatherby at the end, as they run by, I had Principal Weatherby stick his head out of the office and, like, looking back, like, what, what the hell are those kids <laughs> doing? It ended up We ended up cutting it for time but um but yeah it's a fun little moment 
Yeah, it's great. <clears throat> and uh, so they run down the hallway, and Jughead gets surrounded by serpents at the at the Southside High cafeteria. Yeah, um, another another fun one. I know I talked to Roberto about this, and and he I think had been hoping that we would make Southside High look even more grim and more decrepit and dilapidated. And I, I was, I, you know, one of a rare instance where I sort of pushed back with Roberto a little bit just to say, listen, man, I think coming from this sort of very, uh, you know, almost idealistic uh, um, Riverdale High, it, it, Riverdale High sometimes to me feels like it belongs in like a, a Hardy Boy novel, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, and, and, um, you know, this, this moment here when you go to Southside, I just didn't want it to feel like it was like a, um, what the hell was the name of that Coolio Michelle Pfeiffer from movie Dangerous Minds. Dangerous Minds. I didn't, I didn't want it to feel like suddenly we were walking into like the parody version of Dangerous Minds. Right. You know, I mean, it's pretty severe to begin with. So I, I pushed back a little bit on making it more severe than it already is. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's a fun little moment and kind of a, a, a you know to kind of bait and switch a little bit as if Jughead. I don't know if it really plays, but the hope was that Jughead's sitting there and he's he's intimidated by these guys and they're giving him a hard time. And then as our group approaches, <laughs> we realize that he's you know telling them a joke quietly or something, and they're all laughing and loving him and he's fitting right in. But um, but yeah, I mean it was a it was it was fun to able to escape into the dark CD world of Southside High after after doing a lot of stuff at uh, on stage at Riverdale that's for sure yeah no and and it absolutely works the when when they when the gang shows up and they've gone through these you know heroic efforts to get to him and to find yeah. that he's you know perfectly happy yeah exactly and and I love I love the way Cole plays that line when he turns to them. He's he's really kind of nails that little <laughs> that little moment there. Yeah. Over at uh, then we got on the South Side High, the front steps. Betty and Jug uh, they make peace. Cheryl texts Verana, she's gonna go be with her brother. And yeah. Um, then, then we have the big the big set piece. Yeah. Well, well, this scene is 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 you know was sort of changed very late. I'll, I'll just share this with you. Um, this was a note that actually came from Greg Berlanti that he really wanted the whole group to be present uh, to save Cheryl. And and up until kind of the 11th hour, it was just Archie and Veronica who end up at Sweetwater River to save Cheryl. And I'm really glad, ultimately, that, that he, he stepped in and said, no, it's, it should be our group together because it's, it's a much more... Uh, you know, electric kind of moment with with our, all of our heroes on screen. Um, but the, this the little scene that tees it up is nice. We get to kind of track you know a more sort of sort of Jughead and, and um, Betty's character, uh, just character moments for the two of them that of course will pay off later uh, at the end of the show when the serpents show up at uh, FP's trailer. And um, and and you know it's a nice also it's a little twist on the Archie Veronica relationship that mm -hmm. little moment that they have there, um, and of course all this t is teeing up Sweetwater River which which I'm going to dive into here now yeah. because it's our big gigantic set piece of the episode and I I'd like to think the sort of biggest set piece in many ways of the of the first season at least in terms of. Um, well, I don't know what, if that's true, but <laughs> no, it definitely <laughs> is. It, it definitely was, it's it spectacular. It was most complicated. I mean, the, the pep rally of 102 and other things, <laughs> you know, certainly were more difficult. But this was this was a ton of fun. What I will say is this: this location was, you know, a good hour and a half north of of Vancouver, and it was really brutal. We this is one of those sort of like the the movie or TV gods were looking down kindly on us because we had picked a different location. We had scouted it. We had tech scouted it, meaning um, you do a tech scout right before you, you go to camera, right before you start shooting, um, where where it's not just you and the location manager and your AD and a couple of people, but you go there with the entire, all the department heads. You know, you're going to each location of the episode or whatever you're shooting with, you know, 40, 60, 80 people and walking as a, as a director, you're walking them through what's going to happen at that location 
where your where camera's going to be, how you're going to shoot it. Um, you know, the other departments are deciding. You know, where are they going to park trucks? Where is cable going to run? How are we going to light? You know, it, it's it's a it's a pretty involved effort. And so to, I've actually never been in a situation where we've tech scouted something and then lost the location. Um, granted, series directing it's a much more compressed schedule so these kinds of things happen but it's, it's never happened to me so i was having a heart attack <laughs> this location that we ended up shooting it in is far far better than the location we had picked and and we hadn't decided on this the location we ended up at but because it was so far away and then we got sort of forced to go there so it's one of those things where like production would have never let me go you know, an hour and a half outside of Vancouver, and and we ended up kind of being forced to, which which thank God we did because the production value at this actual frozen lake was, um, I think, kind of priceless. And and on top of that, it's an actual frozen lake that we're shooting on. The other location we were going to basically create a frozen river slash lake in a in a parking lot with lots of snow another lucky thing i'll just say is that it was really cold in the week leading up to it which made it safe for us to have cast and crew out on a frozen lake um <clears throat> getting into this sort of breakup of the scene i had showed our cast and crew a scene um from another movie called rust and bone um and and if if you are familiar with the movie, sure. you know that I've I've really done a sort of shameless job of ripping off uh, <laughs> what happens here. In fact, when when Roberto was walking me through the beats of 113 before I'd even seen a script, I said, "Well, have you seen Rust and Bone? You've got to revisit that scene on the lake because it's it's really moving, and I think this would be a great sort of big." cathartic kind of moment for Archie and he he had seen it but then went back and rewatched and said oh my god yes we have to do that that's what we got to do and so the scene is actually you know shot over the course of a, a few different days all the exterior stuff that you see here is shot actually on the frozen lake at the end of the sequence as KJ is we're in that low angle where KJ is actually punching the ice what's happened is he's run up to the hole in the ice He's moved the snow away from the ice. He's found Cheryl, and he starts punching the ice. Before he does that, we, we move the stunt coordinator standing right off camera, and he moves a pad in under him, and, and KJ is punching the pad. For anybody who's seen the show and, and knows KJ <laughs> occasionally appears with his shirt off, he's a very <laughs> fit, very strong, young Kiwi. Yeah. And KJ was punching the pad so hard. I mean, really going 110%. He was punching the pad so hard that after one take, he, we all, we, I called cut and we all looked at each other and, and I looked at KJ's hand and, and right away we could tell something was not right. Now, KJ is such a sort of tough guy. He wouldn't have any, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, let's go again, let's go again, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And, and Sean Elliott, our A camera operator, who's a wonderful guy who I love working with, turned to me and said, He's not okay, dude. We gotta we gotta call a medic over. And and sort of cut to the end of the story, KJ had punched the the pad so hard that he had broken a couple fingers in his in his right hand. And I know I touched on this a little bit earlier in our conversation, but um this is where, where it happened. So in the scene where, you know, it's scripted that he's meant to break his hand on the ice. That was that was how it was meant to play. <laughs> but um we didn't actually want him to break Amazing. his hand on the ice. But but it is it is a some indication of of KJ's, you know, commitment and, and how you know uh, how devoted he is to that role and and wanting every shot to be the best and and um you know he's such a sweetheart that you know he never complained never never showed any pain um michael one of our producers and i went to the hospital with him afterwards and um and hung out with him while he got x-rayed and whatnot and of course he couldn't have been a better sport about the whole thing but it was um it was it was a kind of a dramatic end to a, a pretty dramatic day yeah. um you know and and i'll just say and i know we'll, we'll get to it the the other pieces for those of you out there that are interested in the sort of technical side that you know we shot cheryl later at the very end of our schedule we shot madeline on a on an on set on our stage where we built a set piece of 
a frozen lake. So we actually had a tank with um, with what what appeared to be frozen ice, which was a combination of wax and and I'd have to get Kyle, the effects coordinator, to tell you exactly <laughs> what some of the other material was. But but all those underwater sequences were shot at our stage in a tank, and then we actually had KJ up there and and you know so again one of those sort of um set pieces where it's 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 challenging but a lot of fun where you're sort of stitching together lots of little pieces that you shoot over the course of different days and different locations and um yeah I'm I'm really I'm really happy with the way it came together. No, it was amazing and it it was I have to say throughout the entire season that when that footage came back uh, specifically for for the the sequence where the kids are running running out to her on the ice yeah. through the snow, the yeah. cinematic quality was so breathtaking that we were constantly watching it over and over and over again in every <laughs> different take because it just looked it doesn't look like television. Oh, that's nice of you, Bob. Well, well, thank you. We were certainly aiming high and wanted it to you know wanted it to be worthy of the season finale and wanted it to have as much scope as as possible you know which is why i like showing the cast and crew little you know we get together for like a a, a movie night basically and i show clips and i show them rust and bone which hmm. again has has some of that scope um there was a few other things we played which were you know kind of embracing the big icy winter wonderland and kind of um making sure that it had it had that that that, that location had a feeling of of real um the magnitude to it that uh, that felt cinematic. So I'm I'm glad that you guys felt that way. And and look, I, I a lot of credit is 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 owed to the the camera and yeah. open electric department who made that all possible. I mean, the shot you're referring to, or the shots you're referring to, which are candidly some of my favorite too. We had three feet of snow on top of the ice, right. which which we weren't expecting. And and so we, you know, we got there on that day, but to do a big, you know, I'd storyboarded all of this with Rob Pratt, my storyboard artist, and and we had planned on those big moving shots. I love sort of converging on the cast, so they're running at camera and camera's racing towards them to really kind of emphasize the speed, and I, I wanted it to be handheld, to feel chaotic, but to, to achieve those, you know, we didn't have a, the, the right equipment would have been, you know, a crane, you know, and you would right. swing the crane arm across and you could really get a lot of speed that way. But unfortunately, we couldn't put a crane and a crane base, which weighs thousands of pounds on the <laughs> ice. So so what we did, and this is, again, Kyle Moore, who's been an effects guy in Vancouver. I've worked with a lot on a lot of different projects. And big shout out to Kyle and TJ and his boys because they are hardest working guys in show business. You know, they, along with the group department, shoveled a big you know, 50, 100 yard channel in the snow so that we would get right down to the ice and then the grips built a makeshift sled uh, with, with you know, speed rail and God knows what else. And then we had our camera operators getting on the sled and the grips pushing them on the sled in this channel we need to get get some of those shots so you know um I, again when i say credit it really is is due in a big way to the to the, the whole crew and that's what i mean i mean it was really a team effort to get those shots and i'm just so grateful that i could show them these little storyboards that we've drawn it's very easy to draw them <laughs> a, you know a warm office and then get yeah. out there and it's you know it's below it's below freezing and uh, and well, we got to figure out a way to do this kind of on the fly. So anyway, um, a shout out to my, my guys up there who are so great. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. At the top of Act 5, uh, over to the Lodge apartment, Cheryl is warming up. I love this little scene. It's a simple little scene. I love what Steve Jackson, our DP, did with the fire gag on on <clears throat> Uh, on Madeline's face there, I think that looked really spot on, and mm -hmm. um, you know, and and again the tension between Marisol, um, excuse me, between Hermione and um, and and Veronica still sort of simmering there, which I which I really loved, and um, yeah, I just it's a it's a it's a little scene that that could have been kind of thrown away, but it's such a nice tee up to the end of Cheryl's journey with the burning down of Thornhill. Um, totally. Uh, I really am glad it stayed in the show. 
It is the, uh, the proverbial uh, calm before the storm. Yes, it's exactly right. Well, that was what I, I told Natalie. Was I was like, I want you to play this. Like, you, you've now, you know, you've seen the other side. You've seen death. You've come back to life. And and now you see the path ahead, and you know what you're, you're going to do. You yeah. know you're going to go to the house and 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 burn it to the ground. And and that there's a kind of a you know a calm that has taken over you because you know what you need to do and you know the path forward. So she's um, she does a great job of of doing that there with without doing too much. Totally. At the Cooper house and uh, Betty's bedroom, <coughs> Betty is uh, preparing for her speech, and she's totally devastated over Jughead leaving. Yeah, um, I was trying to uh, do kind of a mere, no pun intended, image to the scene we had in, I believe it's 102, and again, I'm sorry, my memory's already getting foggy, but there's a, there's a really fun scene that I really loved how it came out in 102, I believe, where um, where Alice comes up to Betty. No, I'm sorry, it's 103. What am I saying? I'm sorry. <laughs> so episode three, Betty getting ready before she's going to go seduce Chuck and become uh, diabolique. And, and right. you, you're familiar with the scene I'm talking yes, about. Yes, um, yes. In fact, it's, it seems to be the episode that people talk <laughs> the most about, of, of what I've seen, of the, at least the episode that I've worked on, um, just because of gets, getting to see Betty and Veronica kind of go to the dark side, as it were. But, um, but in that moment, she's getting ready to go meet Chuck at Pop Diner, and she's putting on this lipstick, and Alice comes in and, and wipes the lipstick off of her in kind of totally. an angry manner. And I wanted the blocking in the camera to um, basically mimic some of the same stuff we did there, but of course the um, the tone of the scene is really soft. It's, it, it, it was meant to be kind of like a bookend to that moment, or even a bookend to the moment in in the pilot where Alice comes in and she gives Betty her, uh, you know, Adderall medication or ADD medication. Um, you know, this is becoming full circle. So I wanted to kind of try and address that, and that's why we tried to make the blocking in camera um, the same as, as that moment, 103. Again, no one no one will see this <laughs> except me, but I, I'm trying to tie these things together as best I can. No, it's good. Um, over in uh, City Hall, uh, Veronica confronts Archie about Betty. And Josie tells Archie that they're going to sing his song. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this was um, this was a scene we did actually with you know with KJ's real cast. Fortunately, this was after he really broke his hand. I mean, yeah, right. unfortunate, of course, but um, we sh- we had this scene scheduled after he actually broke his hand, is what I meant to say. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, KJ and 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 Cami are, are great together. As our uh, this was, I, I'm pretty certain. In fact, I am certain this was um, Ashley and Haley and Asha's last scene of of season one. So we we wrapped them here, which was sort of bittersweet, and they were all so sweet. They were, you know, begging to do one more take. I think they didn't <laughs> want it to end, but. Um, but they're they're darling here, and it's a great sort of moment to kind of ramp up the the pep rally. Definitely. Excuse me, not the pep rally, but the um, jubilee. Ramp ramp up the jubilee. Thank you. Absolutely. And then over at the uh, sheriff's station, Jughead tells uh, FB not to worry about him. Uh, and there's a really solid father son bonding scene. Yeah, I you know I I love uh, Cole and Skeet are so great together. I mean, I remember seeing episodes. Um, that, that Roberto had sent me early on before the show started to air of, of, you know, just like 104 and beyond of when Skeet joined the show and, and seeing them together. And I was like, man, uh, David Rappaport, who, who casts uh, Riverdale and casts all of uh, Greg Berlanti shows, is just knocked out of the park. I yeah. mean, they're so great together. And, um, yeah, this was a scene, again, I, a little bit of a broken record, but... Um, this was a scene that unfortunately got sort of stuck on the very end of a very, very long day. And we were very, we were in some bad overtime. I was pretty stressed out and manic. And um, fortunately for me, Skeet and Cole were cool as 
cucumbers and <laughs> and came and really delivered the goods and and I love the way it turned out because I was really nervous whenever you're in a situation where you're you're feeling panicked about time and everything else and you have such yeah. an important scene it kind of colors the way you see the scene and so when I when it got cut together I was relieved to see that it worked and and the two of them are, are really great together. Uh, no, it it absolutely works. Over to uh, City Hall, uh, we have the song, and then Betty gives her speech to the community. We yeah. must do better. I, yeah, you know, I tried something here I haven't done before, which is I shot this entire sort of sequence together. So in other words, we shot Robin Givens, who I absolutely adore, <clears throat> coming out on, I feel like I, the only times I shoot her, she's coming out on stage. I mean, it yep. started in 102 <laughs> with the pet brown. Totally. Every time she's just coming out on stage and delivering a speech. But, um, <clears throat> but I, you know, uh, we shot, we shot it all together. So Robin would come out, give her a little speech, introduce the Pussycats and Archie. They'd come out, they'd play their whole performance. And then Lily would come out, and and Betty would give her her speech. And I, I usually, when it's that much material, I, I I tend to break it up. But I'm really glad I ended up doing this way. I think it was helpful for the talent to sort of keep track of what was going on. You get real reactions, crowd, and um, and this is just sort of a beast of a day because you're dealing with so many characters, so many moments, a big crowd to react to everything. Um, but I really like how this turned out. And, and once again, you know, the amazing Lily Reinhardt delivers and I love what she did with her speech. It was, it was so great. And, um, and we, we wrapped Casey Cott here shooting the scene, him standing and clapping and reacting mm-hmm. was, was his last thing. And then we, he ran off to catch a flight, but, um, but it was it was great to get to wrap him and have a room full with like 150 extras plus cast and crew <laughs> and everybody you know, clapping together. It was it was quite the send off for Casey. That's amazing. That's cool. Yeah. So into Act Six, uh, over to the city hall. Fred makes an offer to help Hermione, but he is not going to sell. Um, another thing that, that we we got a little jammed on time for and. Um, once again, you know, Luke Perry and Marisol Nichols to the rescue who just came in and nailed it. So I only needed to do a couple takes on either side. I was worried this whole storyline would get lost again for time because there's so many storylines to track. But once again, um, with actors who are this prepared and dialed in and ready to give you everything they've got and are on time, um, you know, you're able to save these extra storylines and, and, and and thank goodness for that because the show is so much richer with with so many of these storylines going on and being able to track them and care about all these people. So it's a it's an interesting way to to end um, uh, their their sort of story here. And I will say, in the first draft, in many drafts of this show that I that I, I received before we started shooting. Um, this was not Marisol's last scene. Her last scene was, uh, it was it was the end of the episode, was not Fred being shot. Can I say this? You sure? It, the end of the episode was not Fred getting shot, but it was um, Hiram showing up and, and Archie sneaking out of Veronica's bedroom to find Hiram. That was, that was the end of the episode. Um, and it changed very, very late. I mean, I think we were already shooting when we found out it was changing. And um, in any event, that, that that obviously changed the the arc for for Marisol. But I think it's it's um, you know it's a really nice way to sort of send her off into season two at this crossroads with Fred, crossroads with her her husband, the business, her relationship with Veronica. I mean, it's a really rich place to to go from in season two. Yeah, absolutely. So now we're going to get into uh, we're going to we'll start off over at the Blossom Manor, and uh, Cheryl looking absolutely spectacular, facing the facing the giant fire in her white dress, turns around and torches the joint. Yeah, again, again, this is day one, and I felt a little bit off my game. Um, fortunately for me, Natalie and, and Madeline were fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, Madeline looks pretty spectacular in that white dress. It's a very haunting kind of image. And um, 
And then we got to have some fun late in the schedule. At the very end of our schedule, we shot all those little pieces of the candelabra landing on a on the rug and and igniting, which um, you know Kyle again and his effects team rigged up for us, and it was it was such a, a helpful piece to have here for to kind of get this big montage, uh, this big sequence really kind of motoring along. It's a great sort of, it's a great way to sort of ignite that um, pun intended, I suppose. <laughs> and then we, we get into this, you know, uh, Imagine Dragons um, montage sequence that, oh my gosh, I, I, I think I have watched every version, every cut of this because it never gets old for me. I enjoy this sequence so much. And a lot of it has to do with how it fits uh, in the in the rhythm of that music. Well, I, the, the credit for this really goes to, to Dan, my editor, for, for this episode. Because he pulled this song. And this song was in his assembly that he sent me. And I, I called him right away. <clears throat> I was already in Atlanta working on another pilot and I called him in the middle of the night. I was like, man, you have absolutely nailed it with, with this one. It's just really perfect. Cause you're right. I mean, it's just sometimes you drop a song in and obviously there's a lot of Dan massaging it, making picture work. It really, um, it really sang with, with this, with this particular track and it just fits so beautifully. Um, and, and, you know, we, we continue to massage it, but a lot of what you see is really, you know, Dan's work constructing. I mean, it was, you know, designed to be this one sort of piece, but the way Dan put it together with this music was it was absolutely perfect. So I'm with you. I'm a, I'm a fan of, of, of this sort of final sequence before our, our final scene. And, and um, it especially, I think, helps keep the the sex scene, the, the romance, uh, if you will, between uh, Archie and, and Veronica and, and Betty and Jughead. Uh, it's, it's, it's really electric and alive. And I like, I like tying them together. You know, visually we were trying to sort of tie them all together. That these were almost, these things were almost happening at the same time. Yeah. Sort of thing. This, this real sort of the final step in, in a loss of innocence that these, these kids have, have gone through, in addition to so many other things this this season, that this is sort of the final frontier, as it were. Absolutely, and I, and I think yeah, part of the you know, what works for me so well is that the music has this sort of explosive rhythm to it that yeah. perfectly matches, you know, a a <laughs> dual sex scene, and perfectly <laughs> matches, you know, blowing the mansion up, and then yeah. you, we bring it way down. With the serpents coming up and Jughead gets the jacket and then crank it right back up. I mean, it, it's such a great, fun sequence. Exciting. Now again, D yeah, Dan gets all the credit. Um, it really worked great. I mean, I, and 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 the I will say another quick thing, which is just that the 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 last moment between um, Cole and Betty, the whole thing where the serpents show up, we actually <laughs> we. We had to shoot that. That was the very last thing we shot. That that wrapped the season. Right. The the sort of um, sex scene, as it were, and the you know the lead up uh, to you know I love you, and then them getting sort of hot and heavy in the kitchen. That was shot on a different night. We were supposed to shoot the serpents, and we just didn't get to it. We had to come back. And and Cole and Lily being you know so great, we were able to kind of get back to that place, and and we were able to kind of you know, feel like we just had come out of that moment. Um, and I, and I, one of the clips that I had showed everybody was the end of the Godfather, which of course everyone's familiar with, but the, that, that door sort of slowly closing on Diane Keaton in the last shot of the Godfather was, was sort of as pretentious as that might sound. Yeah. Was sort of what we were thinking about was that really, really kind of potentially getting shut out on this alternate road that, that Jug had, well might take in season two yeah. um but yeah it works really nicely and a big shout out to all the guys that played serpents that night and to ian our dog handler who, who <laughs> found that sheep dog and we were out there you know hour 14 35 degrees and pouring rain it was just nasty it was a, kind of a nasty way to finish the the season but um it's 
nasty, but I tell you what, it looks great. The rain outside, the wet yeah, beard, no, the dog. Oh my god. It adds it just certainly adds to the to the mood. So for for that I'm I'm grateful for sure. Totally. And then of course we uh we wrap up uh season uh, season 1 with uh the diner sequence. Yeah, I mean <clears throat> this was a this was a really hard scene for a lot of you know from a technical perspective from a performance perspective um and and largely because it it was changed you know as i mentioned a minute ago this was not the ending that that was in the script when i started prepping and even as i mentioned all the way into the beginning of photography we were shooting the show and suddenly we got this new ending roberto had called me and, and tipped me off to it and i was really excited by it because it's it's obviously it's such a it's a much bigger cliffhanger for the season and um and and it made a lot more sense for a lot of reasons and especially the way roberto explained it and, and what he wants to do in season two but um, but for me, candidly, it was it, it, I, I've kind of there was a big gulp because I really like to prepare and and I feel like you make you know as a filmmaker you're really making your film or your pilot or your episode in the preparation and then right. when you shoot you're just executing what you've made um, if that makes any sense at all totally. and so for for a scene that was so so in, in incredibly important uh, for a scene that was, you know, going to be had some moving, you know, it's not a set piece in Transformers, but it's, it's got some moving pieces. And, and, and for a scene that I knew we were only going to have a few hours to shoot, it was, it was really nervous, but um, I, you know, look, it came together in a, in a really nice way. And I think once again, Luke Perry being so devoted, so wonderful, so game to kind of get in there and just let's do it. I know we don't have a ton of time, but I'm going to nail it for you right out of the gate. Um, made this work. Our effects guys did a wonderful job with the blood. And um, it, perhaps in a fitting, although somewhat morbid manner, this was this was Luke's last scene of, of season one. So we wrapped him after this. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a little bit, it was a little eerie. It was a little sad yeah. to sort of then say, you know, give him a big hug and and say goodbye and I'll see you soon. You know what I mean? There was yeah, a, there totally. was a very kind of somber mood after shooting this. Um uh uh and I want to give a quick shout out to Alvin who plays Pop who, you know, <laughs> I I I cast I well I could say that a little bit. He's a Vancouver local, but I when I saw his face, I was like I have to have that guy in this show. He's got such a wonderful face and he's yeah. such a sweetheart. He's also the head of the the um it's not sag up there but he's he's the head of the the actors guild up in uh in amazing i had no um, idea and a wonderful actor who of course doesn't get to do a ton on the show hopefully there'll be more in season two for him he's so so talented and so lovely um but he was great because i wanted to go for something that felt really violent and and horrifying and and i had showed them clips from uh, the Place Beyond the Pines, that really great Derek C. and France movie sure. with Ryan Gosling, where Gosling is robbing the banks and he's running up on the counters and he's grabbing people by their necktie and dragging them around. And, you know, I wanted to have some some of that physicality and, and he was so lovely and um, such a good sport about it. Um, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it, it again, it was, um, I think John Goldwater, who's the head of Archie Comics, was a, I'd heard, and he's lovely, and and we get along great. But I, I'd heard through the grapevine that he saw these dailies and was horrified that it was like way too dark. But the the intent was always to <clears throat> make it a little bit more of a you know certainly sad and hopefully suspenseful, but kind of finding the the lyrical quality of the scene and not the big ruckus noisy version if right. that makes any sense which is why you know we go into Archie's head and the sound kind of falls away and and we we go into something that again is is a little bit more uh, lyrical for lack of a better word well and w in the nature of a, of a story like this at a TV show like this you know you have episode 12 that sort of resolves the main <clears throat> mystery 
And yep. 13 is more or less, it's a bit of an epilogue, but then we're getting into let's wind up for what's about to become. Yeah. You yeah, know, no, and, and exactly get the people right. wanting more, right? Yeah, well, I, I hope that's the case. And, I, you know, again, as I said earlier, when Roberto told me that they were going to reveal Jason's killer in 112, I was a little heartbroken because I thought, <laughs> you know, I thought I had earned, <laughs> earned it. <laughs> But 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 you're absolutely right, Bob. Is that you know in a <clears throat> in a series like this, you want to be able to wrap up kind of the big mystery in an episode, and then in your final episode, be able to kind of tee up what's to come right. in 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 the next season. And I think I think this episode does a, a a nice job, and I mean that from a writing perspective of 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 doing just that. Absolutely. All right. Now we got a couple of questions here from yeah. our fans online. Uh, Rebecca at Rebecca is who I am. I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, what's your favorite part and the toughest part of directing a mashup genre of comic book comedy and uh, a dark murder mystery? <clears throat> oh, God. Good question. Um, I think my favorite part is is being able to um, – borrow kind of iconography from a variety of different sources uh as the makeup for the 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 visual landscape of this show which which is a long way of saying you know i saw this when i first read the pilot as um american graffiti through the eyes of david lynch you know right. and so getting to sort of borrow from all of all of the sort of visual motifs of of uh, of something like American Graffiti or or even The Outsiders and it kind of like you know Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas's version of the 50s meets the kind of twisted uh, perverse uh, bizarre mind of David Lynch and kind of get, seeing it through that lens like that was just a fun idea to kind of play with and something that I hadn't really seen a lot of on television. Um, and, and the hardest part, God, um, this is such a lame answer, but you know, the hardest part is just doing all the things I really want to do, um, both, both with performance and, and technically in a very short amount of time, because the, the wonderful thing about the way Roberto writes is that, the world is really rich. It's really lush. It's visually uh, exciting. He writes. He writes for filmmakers. You know, a lot of writers don't take a lot of things in mind when they write, um, namely technical parts of the show or what really makes sense. Suddenly, people are people are outside, and suddenly they're inside, and there's no really kind of understanding as to why. And 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 Roberto. Roberto understands filmmaking first right. and foremost, and so you know he writes a very visually rich script, and so the hardest part is sometimes feeling like you're not totally servicing that, mm -hmm. or you're not getting to things that you're really excited to show people, um, whether it's a character moment or a visual flourish, just because you don't have time to do it on this on this timeline. That's Sorry for the boring answer to that. No, that's, that's great. Uh, Alice at Ali Pally 94 wants to know who your main inspirations or people you look up to when it comes to directing. Oh, another good question. I could go on forever. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of the usual suspects. Um, you know, I love, uh, as far as contemporary guys go, you know, I think David Fincher, like most people, is a, is a pretty brilliant technician. Um I love Steven Soderbergh's work. I mentioned Hal Ashby before. I'm a big Hal Ashby fan. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also, I love Milos Forman. I think, uh, you know, he uh, was was kind of a, a, a master that maybe didn't get his due. I think most people know he was masterful, but he's especially um, near and dear to my heart. Um, I also loved, if we're talking about, like, just pure performance stuff, I love John Cassavetes. Sure. Um, faces made a, a huge impact on me uh, when I was sort of really just getting into movies and what he was doing with performances kind of blew the lid off a lot of things. Um, and then, you know, um, I'm bouncing around here a little bit, but uh, the reason I got into wanted to make movies and wanted to make television is 
Robert Zemeckis, Back to the Future. Oh, Still a perfect movie. Yep. Still a perfect movie. Agreed. Um, obviously, that's one of many amazing movies he made. Romancing the Stone. I could, you know, I mean, <laughs> Absolutely. This is another one. Romancing the Stone is the reason the studio let him make Back to the Future, incidentally. But, yeah, I, I would be um, remiss if I didn't mention the amazing, wonderful uh, Robert Zemeckis as well. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not, I don't consider myself like a super, you know, snob. I, I, you know, there's a lot of filmmakers who get a hard time who I go, you know, these guys, he's not, he or she is not so bad. You know, they're, right. they're actually good at what they do. They just maybe pick material that you don't find interesting. Um, no, but, but that, that's, um, those are, that's kind of a, a quick, hit list of guys you know Denis Villeneuve of course is kind of batting a thousand right now and continues mm-hmm. to blow my mind in terms of newer contemporary filmmakers um Nick Reffin's another one who I, I absolutely love and um uh you know anyway there, there's a long list but I'll keep it to, <laughs> to that for now yeah. it's all good stuff and yes if if you for the young filmmakers out in the crowd or old filmmakers out in the crowd all of those directors take a look at. There's something to be learned from each and every one of them. Yeah, absolutely. And our last question here comes from uh, MK Hay, um, who wants to know, since you pr- shot the premiere and the finale, did you find that one was easier than the other? Uh, the pilot was easier. Uh, the pilot was easier because we had a lot more time and, candidly, a lot more money. Right. Um the the finale was uh, trying to fit an equally big, if not bigger, episode into <laughs> less time and less money. So it was a lot yeah. more challenging. And um, but both were but both were a blast. And I really I loved um, having the opportunity to do both and to kind of bookend the season. Um, uh, it was it was a real a blast and a real. Uh, pleasure for me and a privilege so um but yeah the short answer is the um the pilot was certainly not without its challenges but um but easier <laughs> Definitely. well lee thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come on the podcast and uh, chat with the folks my pleasure bob and thank you for your time i'm sorry i know i'm, I'm pretty long-winded i hope i'm not <laughs> creating a total nightmare for you to no, edit no, down no. into something that uh is is a reasonable length but no it was a pleasure to talk about riverdale um i love the show i love that people have 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 found it that it's found its audience and um looking forward to um seeing what happens in season two absolutely have a great night we'll talk again real soon thanks bob you too take care man bye all right bye-bye well that does it folks that is the end of season one of Welcome to Riverdale, and of course, your favorite show on the CW, Riverdale. Uh, Like I said, it is super exciting to be able to tell y'all that season two is right around the corner, and the powers that be are hard at work to try to make an even more explosive second season than there was the first season, which is hard to believe. Um, But... Like I said, if uh, if this podcast and if, if the show Riverdale is something that you like, please reach out. Please send those messages via social media to Warner Brothers Television and the CW. Those comments do not fall on deaf ears. And the last thing I want to mention is that our post coordinator, who I mentioned early in the show, Michelle Jensen, um, who's been a huge help on this show, with whom I could not do it without, has an amazing app called Nerd App. And uh, if you are like me and you are looking for some nerdy things going on in in your part of the country or part of the world, check out her app. Uh, It's available on on the iTunes Store and Android Play. Um, So it's super fun and it's a great way to keep keep connected and to have a, a really broad idea of what's going on in the Nerdosphere. Um, That being said, we'll see you next season. Until season two, hashtag Riverdale Strong. First things first, I'm going to say all the words inside my head. I'm fired up and tired of the way that things have been. Oh, the way that things have been. Oh, second thing, second, don't you tell me what you think that I can be. I'm the one. My 
Share it 